Um, thank you. It's it's really like a TED talk uh, with this stuff. Um, so I'll, I'll try to be extra energetic, uh, also having in mind this this lovely lovely um, lunches that that the organizer organizer has been providing. So thank you also for for that. Um, yes. Um, so I'll be um, I'll be uh, because it's almost over of the conference. I had the privilege and, and chance to to hear many speakers and presenters, and I um, I'd like to 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 kind of uh, refer to some of the things that have been already mentioned um, in, in in a slightly different way. I mean, what we often do and what I also often do is is, is to describe a positive, successful projects, and that's that's fine. I mean, this is how it works. Uh, but what what it, what it means that we often not talk about those projects that were n not so successful or un un unsuccessful, and the paradox is that actually uh, the, the the learning process uh, is is far more valuable with those projects that didn't kind of work as we hoped. Uh, and of course, I'm not putting any of those projects in my uh, annual reports for board members or or uh, <laughs> funders. Uh, but nevertheless. Uh, we're here as a, as a family members and colleagues, and, and um, I'd like to, to look at, at those, those issues. Um, and, and the title of my, uh, my speech is, is uh, mm, uh, Old Challenges, uh, or actually, it's New Challenges and Old Solutions. Uh, a couple of months ago, in the summer, uh, in Krakow, we had an a conference organized in honor of, of the Jewish Heritage Europe website port portal, uh, Ruch and Gruber, and, and in that very um, conference, uh, we, we, we had a, a, a panel that was called Old Challenges, New Solutions, where we looked at, um, at some of the new approaches that, that we've seen happening in, uh, in Europe in terms of Jewish heritage, because this is what I, what I actually uh, am involved with. Uh, but here again, I'd like to reverse this, this subject and look at the new challenges that, are, that we all see, the, the, the changes that, that we all see. Life, the world is changing, even in Poland, things are changing. Uh, and, and surprisingly, often enough, we use all solutions. We use the tools that we've been we inherited uh, or were developed uh, years and years ago, and that uh, often don't really fit to the new um, situation. Um, and that's going to be uh, that's going to be uh, what I'll be uh, talking about. Um, here it is. Um, but before uh, I'll, I'll also be kind of describe you where I'm coming from. Yes, I am the director of the Galicia Jewish Museum. I took over the museum in 2010, and and, and since then uh, I believe we've been quite successful uh, in, in many many different ways. Um, the number of visitors of the museum grew up from whether it was 20,000 in 20, 2010 all the way to more than 70,000 people in 2019. Then, of course. Uh, world got locked um, with COVID, uh, and, and, and I mean, the 2023 looks 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 um, very well for us. Um, so, so we've been able to create from from together with my colleagues, my board members uh, from the Galicia Jewish Museum, a very well known place, at least in in, in Krakow, in Poland. Some of us, uh, some of some of uh, the people here in the audience, been working with us, so we've been able to put our museum in the map of many different networks and many different connections. Uh, and that's again allowed me to see many different projects. Some of them been very successful, some of them been less successful. And actually, yes, uh, I, I find a great joy in looking at those less successful projects. Not because I'm mean and, and, and like, uh, uh, you know, when people suffer, but actually I, I try to understand what it is, um, what it is that was, 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 uh, was wrong. Um, not to repeat the same errors. All right, um, and, and in terms of uh, sustainability, um, we, we, the museum has also been quite, quite successful um, in, 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 in making, uh, making things better for us, and I think we have the same <laughs> issues. Okay, cool. So uh, again, uh, you know, the, the museum uh, that I'm, I'm running is an NGO, non-governmental organization. We're not having any core funding from the city or from the state of Poland, from the government, uh, which uh, you know, over the last eight years, has been, been a good news uh, for us. Um, but nevertheless, as an NGO, we need to also be creative. We need to be creative in many different ways, also in, in the ways of how to make uh, keep the doors open. If you're an NGO, one of the, your main problems are money. 
Um, and yes, we've been also very, very successful in generating or finding new ways of, of generating those funds that are allowing us to keep the doors open, to do programs that would reach those 70,000 people that came through the doors. But also, on top of those 70,000 people, we've worked with more than 40,000 Poles in their hometowns across southern and eastern Poland. That's 40,000 people in 2019 that we went to with our programs. All of that was sponsored by, uh, by uh, some of those, it, it was sponsored by the grants, but many of those money came from the budget. And again, 2019, 75 or 76% of the operational costs were covered by the income that we've generated at the museum. So again, if you're coming from the museum world, I think you see that this is a quite, a, 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 quite a nice uh, number. Okay, so now, um, in the old days, um, one would uh, what do projects in certain way. I mean, first of all, you, you would identify the need. There's a problem, there's an issue, something is, is, is wrong. Yes, there is a need to repair something. So you have, you have a need. Then you would try to create a, a tools to, to solve uh, that need, to solve that problem. Today, we, we are all calling it a project. So the project was invented. And then when you finally had a need, you had a, a project, you, you, you describe the tools that you need to have to solve the problem, you were after the money. You were looking for money that would allow you to solve, to go back to the beginning to solve the need. Now, these days, things are sometimes look different. Things start with the money. And again, often enough, I see the project that starts not with the need. The project starts with the money. And then, uh, when the money are there, and I, don't get me wrong, we love money. We love money, we love all the budgets and trillions and zillions of, of, of euros and zlotys that are there. But, often enough, we see that the project starts with the money. So there's a group of people that are gathering and saying, well, how can we spend those money? And then they come up with the project, and then they invent the need. Um, and, you know, again, you know, I'm, I'm sure all of us have seen such projects. All of, all of us have seen such projects. Some of us have been participating in those projects. You know, at the end of the day, you know, budget has to be, be closed. Uh, but yes, this is one of the problems that, that we are kind of uh, seeing. And again, we're in Poland, became a masters, the champions of, of the world in, in, in the second kind of approach, which resulted with this kind of re revitalization. Przed means before, after means after. I mean, po means after. So what happened after we've, we've joined the European Union and, and many, many millions of, of euros became available, many of the main squares of the Polish city has been revitalized. <laughs> um, um, so, so, so yes, we ended up with, with having hundreds and hundreds of the main squares of, 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 a, uh, of a Polish cities looking like a frying pan. Uh, <laughs> And now, some of those, those uh, communities will be applying to European Union uh, for money to revert, to re, 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 re revitalize uh, those, those, those projects. Uh, so, so, yes, so this is kind of a side note, uh, in, in a sense of, of, of what been taught, uh, taught, taught uh, what we spoke about uh, in the earlier, earlier uh, programs, that yes, one of the new challenges that we're facing and that is new, is actually that in many cases the money are not the problem. The need is a problem. How to make a project that is, that is, not, uh, that is answering for a real need, that will stay, that will not need further funding. Because again, what, what we are looking, seeing today is that it's, it's easier, it's not easy, it's never been easy, but it's easier to get funds for, to start the project, to do it, to report, to seal it off, and then what happens is that it turns out that nobody really needs that. How many applications, mobile applications there are in, in, in the world universe of, of, of you know, shops, of app, mobile phones that no one has, no one ever used, or no one used after the end of the project because no one no one's been updating them. So that's a, pro, that's a new, new, new challenge, new problem uh, for us. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm there. I'm, I'm, uh, this is also my, my problem. But let's go to, to Poland. Uh, and, and, and kind of look more into what we've been talking here. You know, the, the, someone asked the question of what to do with the, with the um, churches here in Sweden that became empty, that, are, that became uh, abandoned. 
um, there was a number of, of, of those churches, a couple thousand if I, I, if I remember correctly. And actually it's the same question that we've been asking ourselves or similar question that we've been asking ourselves in Poland. I mean, what to do with synagogues that are empty? Uh, today in Poland we have uh, 700, give or take, 700 synagogues uh, still standing, 690 of them will be empty. I mean, will not be used by the Jews. Not empty, but 690 of them will not be an active synagogues. The reason why they are empty is very different, though. In Sweden, in the UK, in Germany, this is a democratic demographic changes. People are just d disconnecting from their religious heritage, part of life. In, in Poland, in terms of, of, of synagogues, uh, it's different. The Jews that have been praying there were all killed. They were all killed. Uh, they never left. They never packed their stuff. They never decided to move... Uh, further to go somewhere else. They never disconnected from their uh, faith or their uh, culture or their heritage. They were killed. And they are buried in the vicinity of those synagogues. So that's, there is a major difference between the situation in, in Eastern Europe and Poland and here in terms of those empty houses of, of worship. Um, according to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, uh, the Germans during the time of the war created more than 40,000 slave labor concentration camps and ghettos, 40,000. Most of them were located in Eastern Europe, more than 25,000 in Poland. So now you tell me what to do with 25,000 places of mass killing, suffering and death. Um, some of them, like Auschwitz, has become well known and are preserved and are part of the narration. Uh, but some of them are mass grave of uh, two families, of, of 10 people, of, of 60 people. Uh, what to do with, with, with those, those sites, what to do uh, in, in context of the mass killings that took place not in the place that we can fence off, you know, mark with, with, with a stone, but uh, many of the mass killings took place within the living spaces, within the living towns. Many of the mass killings took play, would take place at the main squares of the cities, in front of the non-Jewish inhabitants. How do we commemorate? How do we preserve those space? How do we honor the space? which exists in context of the living community. Um, and, and actually, this is one, one, one good example, a recent example. In, uh, we, there, was a, uh, there is a concentration camp. There was a concentration camp also in Kraków. If you come to Kraków, you usually go to Auschwitz. But there was a concentration and slave labor camp in Kraków. You may know it because it was uh, depicted in, the, in Oscar Sch uh, uh, Steven Spielberg's uh, Schindler's List, Płaszów. It, it tells that, that story. So this is how it looked during the time of, of, of the existence. It was huge. There were thousands and thousands of, 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 of prisoners, mostly Jews. This is how it looked. It looks today. I mean, after the uh, very end, during, toward the very end of the war, it was all flattened. Uh, the prisoners were marched into the death marches west to Auschwitz and other places. Uh, there is almost nothing left. So, for another 60, 70, actually until today, uh, this has become an open area, a, a green area, a park. Uh, well, not entirely. Because there were monuments. There are monuments. Uh, this is a, a monument uh, that was erected in 1960s by the communist uh, government. Uh, it is, it is, I mean, very moving. You can't really see it, but these are like four figures. You can see that there's a this this gap, this 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 hole. This is where their hearts, their their hearts should have been. Uh, so they, their hearts are torn apart. And and there is an inscription in that uh, on that uh, on the back of this memorial that says in honor of the innocent victims of the Nazi terror. Again, there is a major problem with that inscription. It doesn't say who is the victim. It doesn't say that the victims, almost all of the people that were killed here, in this very pit, is, a, is, is one of the mass killing sites. So thousands and thousands of people have been, been killed, and the fact that they were Jewish is not mentioned. Um, and the local community decide not to notice this memorial. So it's not even that the, the, the fate of those people is, is not commemorated. I mean, in, in, in universal values, there is a monument devoted to victims. It doesn't say who the victims are. But still, you know that something horrible happened in that, in that location. And yet, we, or local residents, decide to not to see it. So this, this place has become a place of, of, of barbecues, of people are running and jogging, walking their dogs, sunbathing, uh, having sex, uh, uh, walking their, their kids. Everything. This is, has became part of, of a life. Um, and again, this is precisely the killing site of 20, 30,000 people. 
So, so what the, the problem is that in Poland we have also places of, of non-memory. The places that we, 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 we decided not to remember, uh, not to honor, despite sometimes there are physical markers of that, of that process. So, a couple of years ago, the decision of, 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 the, of the city is to, to change that situation. And it's been bothering us. It has really been bothering us how this space is used by the local inhabitants. And, and, and the, the city comes up with an idea of making a museum a museum that will be devoted to the story of this camp. Uh, and, and then a few interesting things happened. I mean, first of all, uh, there is a huge resistance uh, coming in from the local residents, who says that, well, we understand your point, but there is already a museum located 800 meters away, which talks the story about of, of the ghetto, of the persecution, which includes the story of the camp. So you have one museum that tells the story of this place and then you want to create another one in the space which for us is a park. And it's surprising because you know in Poland we've been seeing different things. We've seen uh, uh, right-wingers and Catholics uh, putting crosses in Auschwitz. Uh, we've seen uh, 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 right-wingers not uh, agreeing for recognition of the, of the Jewish, um, Jewish, Jewish heritage. But we haven't seen a group of local citizens that uh, are protesting and what, this, what this, this inscription says, they want to cut down the, the forest. And they kind of came up with, the, with, 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 with this notion that this is our green space. We, we are here today and this, is, this, this space will, should serve us, not the visitors from outside, not the people from uh, coming to the museum, but us living human beings who deserve to have a green space to walk, to joy, uh, to enjoy. Uh, and it was new. I mean, no one ever in Poland faced such a situation when on one hand you had a, you had a the, 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 the Holocaust and the, the commemoration of the Holocaust. And on the other hand, you had a ecologists and local citizens who has been furious about this fact that you need to, you want to to pave the, the, the part of, the, of, this, of, this, uh, of this green area to make a, a parking lot and toilets and shops and, and, and the museum. And, and that's interesting because the city has been pushing, pushing through. Uh, it has not addressed or not been, uh, not decided to, 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 to hear or to make any concession toward those people. Um, and that's part of, of something different that I, that, uh, I wanted to, 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 to mention. And you know, we've been, we've been learning uh, new words during this, this, uh, this, those couple of days, eventification, yes. Uh, and and the, uh, the other word, new word that I, I could bring in is copification. Uh, so what, what, you know, what, what happened in, 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 what happened in, uh, in some point when, in terms of the, the Holocaust was that the, at some point people, rec the world recognized or discovered the Holocaust, first by movies and, 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 and programs, and then by Jewish, by Holocaust museums. And you know, the mo one of the most famous Holocaust museum is in the United States, one of the first ever created, the Washington, uh, United States Holocaust Memorial in Washington. And in many of those museums, where, whether it's, it's Jerusalem, uh, Yad Vashem, or, or, uh, or Washington DC, they've been recreating the space where Holocaust happened which is fine because Holocaust never happened in Washington DC. It never happened in Jerusalem. It happened in Eastern Europe. So they've been putting together those, those, those barracks and, and recreating fences and, and so on to give a visitor an idea of how, how was it? How, would, how did it look? But what we've been seeing in, in Eastern Europe is the same process. So the, the Holocaust museums that have been created in Eastern Europe, the same, follow the same pattern. So they created an, a narrative uh, museums that would talk and depict places, things, and, and stories that happened here. But there is a major difference. Do we really need, and this is this, this museum which is 800 meters away from, from the, this Płaszów concentration uh, camp, which is recreating the camp, making a false, fake, fake barber wire, fake uh, uh, quarry, fake walls, fake barracks at the site, or very close to the site where it actually existed. It is kind of a bit similar that uh, you know if, if one would create a small pyramid 800 meters away from the real pyramid, and expecting visitors go there and skip the big pyramid. 
Um, so this, this, this happening not only in Poland. Some time ago, I was in, in Riga in the conference, and, and they had I mean, some similar problem. There is a, a killing site uh, from the time of the war. After the, the war, it was turned into the park, and today it's an open area. And there was a discussion of what to do. And lots of the ideas were, again, based on this Western, Western approach that we should do. Come here, build a multimedia booth where you could see photographs of that place. Okay, building a, 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 you know, a, making a, a multimedia booth 20 years ago when you had no access to internet was fine. But today, do I really want to go to Riga, to the killing site, to enter the booth and see photographs that I can see in my home? Or instead of I should remove the booth and look around me and see how it looks today. Because in all of those stories, that today, what, what happened between 1945 and today is gone. As if the, the, the fact what happened with the memory after the killing would not be interesting. For us, for me, this is something very interesting. So, five minutes. So, in this museum, 800 meters from, from the concentration camp, you, you not only have a recreation of the concentration camp, you also have a recreation of the ghetto wall, which stands 200 meters away. <laughs> and many of the visitors that will go to that very museum will not go to see the actual wall because they've seen this. So again, this will work in US Holocaust Memorial because they don't have this. <laughs> and yet, this is what we do. Because this is how it was done in many places. And this is, and this is uh, frustrating. Frustrating because the spaces that are original, that are true, that are important as they, is, as they are, are being plunged with, with concrete. And yet new and new and new museums are being built. And don't get me wrong, I'm from the museum. I like the museums. Uh, museums are wonderful. But we don't need to turn everything into a museum. I believe. I think the, 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 the structure can also overshadow very important stories. So in this, this very peculiar, uh, this, very, uh, this, this very space that I'm talking about, um, Again, this new museum that will be there will not talk about the things that happened in that very space for 70 years. It will not talk about us not remembering the Jewish victims. It will not try to understand why today we as, a Poles, we as, as Polish people don't want to remember to those, uh, those people. The, the official narration is that we will remember the victims. All right. I mean, is it really a proper place to remember the victims in the very place where they were killed? The victims were living at the, across the river, a kilometer away. How, do, how we should be remembering there, them there, where they lived, where they were part of the society, and not where they killed. Uh, there's really not really, you know, and that's again the problem. The, the new, new problem that we've been, uh, one of the new problems, or not really new, is all of you will probably know that the surveys about anti-Semitism. That despite all the effort, all the money, all the new institutions that were thrown into combating anti-Semitism, the level of anti-Semitism stays the same. Uh, people not, you know, we're not, not successful. And yet we re repeat and, uh, the same pattern. We do the same. We do the same. Um, and and uh, again, maybe instead of doing the same, we should start to look for new tools, new solutions for this, for this uh, problem. And again, that also comes up with New, with, with, with the fact that people are changing. The audience is changing. We see more and more people for whom this is irre irrelevant. This is ancient history. This is the, became so much, you know, so, so, so much a part of the public culture that it's not really interesting. So actually, what, we, what we've been, you know, at Galicia Jewish Museum, we have a privilege and, and, and opportunity to work with many of the groups that have been to Auschwitz. They go to Auschwitz and then they're coming to Krakow to, and at the Galicia Jewish Museum, they're kind of digesting what they've seen, what they went through. And these are very moving memo, uh, experiences. But increasingly often, we see from the visitors, we hear the feedback from the visitors that says, well, I was disappointed with Auschwitz. I would expect they're going to be more multimedia. Why they are not showing more films? Um, because this is what, is what is happening these days. I mean, again, if you're coming from a museum, I'm sure you've been getting you know, lots, and, lots and lots of offers of how you know, I have a wonderful multimedia app for you. I will uh, make a wonderful uh, virtual experience for you and your visitors. This is what your visitors need. 
And this is what it happens. In, you know, in more and more museums, we see people, instead of looking at object, looking at their smartphone. I mean, it's wonderful for the smartphone producers and wonderful for the, for the, for, for, for the, for the, uh, the people that develop apps. But not really so great for, 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 for the experience. I mean, you know, people kind of, and the Auschwitz thing is, is precisely the, the, the results of this digitalization of, of culture, of heritage. That people kind of uh, are not feeling the value of, of, of interacting with a real thing. Um, and again, don't get me wrong, multimedia applications uh, are, can be great, can expand the knowledge, can, can offer us lots and lots of knowledge, but often they don't. Often they are just a tool that is a reason because the money are there, because there is a new technology and we need to find the solution or usage for this new technology. So we find that we, we, we create apps, we, we ask people to download the app, and again, instead of looking at the, at the picture, look at the font. Um, and again, I mean, uh, you know, there is a, there is a lot of, lots of, lots of um, other issues that I would like to speak, but I don't have time because I'm such a uh, poor talker. Uh, uh, but, um, but yes, I mean, you know, uh, there are, there are, there are different, different approaches. And, um, and in Poland, we still, we still see those places. So what to do with an empty synagogue? What to do with the synagogue that had been in use until the Jews that had been praying there were all killed? What to do with the synagogue in a town where there are no Jews? And again, this is not the theoretical question for us in Poland. This is the very practical question that we're seeing and facing and, and, and are partnering in. So this is one of those examples. There is a small synagogue in a small town. All the Jews of this town, or 99% of the Jews of that town were killed. And, and the synagogue was, was then turned into a shop and another shop and a wor wor workshop. And today, this is how it looks. So what will happen is that finally that there is a local authorities that want to re-innovate this synagogue. And it's wonderful. And they will plaster it all. And they will create a, 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 a place where, yes, you'll learn about the Jews of that village. You'll learn about the past. But all of this will be gone. And for me, this is also a great tragedy. Because again, it will stop the story in 1939 or in 1945. It will not force us to look at the things that we've done. In Poland, we are kind of lucky because we, has, we have always the, the Germans to blame for all the horrible things that happened. And it's very convenient for us. But the things that happened with the synagogue after 1945 were not the Germans. It was us. It was us not remembering. It was us destroying. It was us reusing the, 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 the synagogue, the tombstones, the candelabs, the shoes, the pots, and the pens, and uh, the universe of things that were left after the Jews that had been killed. It's all us. But because we're not willing to do this, and because this is us who will be making this museum, we will not be talking about this. Because we will ruin the story to 1945, and that's it. And that's something that is, again, bothering, bothering me. Not always, not everywhere. And there are some good examples. So, I'm, you know, don't get me wrong. I'm not so, so mean. Uh, uh, there are some positive things that are happening, and we're very proud. One of those is, is Auschwitz, or Oświęcim, the city that you all know as Auschwitz. There is a, next to the, the city, there was also, there is a town. And in this town, the Jews have been living for centuries. For the, the synagogue was burned, was destroyed. For years, it was empty. And, and recently, uh, one of our partner institutions, Auschwitz Jewish Center, has created this very moving park. They were not wanting to create a museum. They were not rebuilding a structure. They were not, not, not uh, you know, putting multimedia uh, projectors. They put a very symbolic uh, uh, tombstones and, and, and plaques at the ground. So you see the emptiness. The emptiness is, 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 is the scream. No one, no shout will be as loud as silence in the place that once was full of life. So, what I would encourage for us to remember that sustainability is all the things that we've discussed, but it's also restraint, it's also moderation, it's also us not going for maximum always in every possible case, even if the money are there. Um, and I think I need to go. But uh, thank you. I hope it was it was uh, interesting. Thank you. Ah, okay. Thank you, Jakob. Um, I think we had a yeah, like a journey into the voids, into the 
into the darkest times, and uh, I think it was really like um, inspiring to think about this. Are there questions, comments? Please raise your hand. Um, I have the, the good fortune of meeting you yesterday and talking to you some about Poland and Krakow. And I've been to your museum twice, and it's a beautiful uh, place. It's full of really heartbreaking traces, but it's we have to face these things. And I was just thinking, what you have done in that museum, which I don't think you said really, was that you show the traces, you show all the traces of the Jewish life. Um, and you've gathered them carefully and with, it seems to me, a lot of attention and love, you've gathered what is left to show that there is still some traces left. But of course, if we are not careful, all the traces will be gone. Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's very kind of you to say. And, and um, yes, at the museum, we, we, we have a core exhibition, which is called Traces of Memory. And it looks in this very thought-provoking way into precisely the traces. And it's not only to present what is left, but it also asks the questions, what's our responsibility today toward those places, toward those stories? How do we want to incorporate them into our living environment? And that's very much the question that, uh, that we've been ask, asking ourselves during this entire conference. How do we make those spaces alive uh, in the environment where the people that would use those places are gone, whether it's because of the Holocaust or because they were gone? Or um, we've discussed this many times over the years, and the, um, this discussion about how to restore Odysseus Synagogue has been alive for many, many years also. And I I think the first time I encountered it was in Schneidtag in, in Germany, where it was a big it was a big thing when the director of the Jewish Museum there decided not to restore it to pristine condition, but to leave the leave the uh, the evidence of the of, of the of the destruction that it had undergone. And there are several other cases in Slovakia and elsewhere. Um, it's I mean, it is a big decision, and it's it's a it's a it's a policy decision about what you want. I I like the fact that when you see the destruction, and I'm wondering if you lost your case in Johnny Dunayets, and they have decided to go in plastic, or will some of the destruction be shown? Will the history, will the post-war history of the building be shown in what happens to this? Because um, it would be it would be a great pity if they just sort of beautified it and yes. and forgot it. Well, of course, I mean, you know, at some point, and, and we're we're part of the discussion with these local uh, local authorities of this small town, uh, and 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 they've been um, listening to us. Uh, but at the same time, as as a local municipality, they they have their own agenda. I mean, they have their own uh, uh, community that they need to cater for. Um, so for them, yes, it's important that this place is not only recognized, but it also offers uh, jobs and is uh, fancy and it's reason to be proud. And, and for them, you know, the, the proudness lie in, yes, in number of multimedia, in, 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 in the new, you know, how, how modern it is. And I understand that, especially if you're in a small town, you know, almost a, a village in, in faraway corner of, of Poland. So, so the case is not still lost, but we see that yes, there is a growing kind of uh, uh, growing pressure on turning it into a very modern uh, meeting place and cultural center where none of this uh, would be would be preserved. And again, I mean, it's not for me. I, I don't want to say that this should be kept like this. Not, not at all. It has to be a living place, and it's fine to renovate it. But yes, to keep some elements of that uh, because this is equally important part of the story of this building. What, happen, what happened after, for the 70 years, after 1945, is equally important. Um, and we don't know whether it's going to be preserved or not, because this is where the story gets more inconvenient. Because it, it then suddenly, from talking about them, the, Ger uh, the, the, the Jews, and them, the Germans, we need to relocate 
and focus on us. And talking about yourself is but you know often uh, more more difficult. So Jacob, you talked about uh, how we tend to copy reality, existing reality, <coughs> in the museums, while also ignoring uh, the actual buildings that are on site. I don't know about Western Europe, but in Central and Eastern Europe, this seems to be a trend not only in museums, but in heritage buildings as well. You have the old uh, manor house crumbling down, and next door you have a Disney park creating an Americanized, so to say, version of, of the same heritage. Do you think there is an underlying cause, uh, sort of a trend that unites all of these actions? Well, um, I, I, yes, I think I think it is because you know we've been, uh, especially in Eastern Europe, uh, you know the story that the, the, the contemporary story, story started for us in 1990s when we we gained independence and for the first time we became we became free in, in many many decades and and the part of the, this 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 uh, feeling was that we need to be we need to become the Germans. You know, for us in Poland, the, 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 for, for many years, the ultimate goal was to become like the Germans, to have, to, to have the highways better than the Germans, to have cars, German cars. Uh, so so, so, so we, we've been kind of taking in whatever was produced in the West, in the Western world, as better, without any discussion. So if you build, uh, you know, an, uh, narrative museums that will have reproductions of the ghetto walls and barber wires and so on, we need to do it the same. So and and, and, and we've done it. So I think there is this kind of feeling of, of, of being, of being behind, of being worse, of 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 of, of the West being always always better. Uh, and I think this is something that maybe now start to slowly to change, but it's it's in many cases it's just just too late. Um, this 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 museum. Um, this museum, again, I'm in that kind of, you probably, it's not that I'm not a big fan of this museum. It's a, a museum called the Museum of the Occupation of Kraków. It's, and and the, the pro, another problem I have is with this museum is, is, is also that it is located in the former, in the factory which was used by Oskar Schindler. So you have a very peculiar special building. The building that was to, 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 that Oskar Schindler took over during the time of the war used as a, as a, as a factory, Thousands of Jews been been working, and because of that work, they they survived. So you have this very unusual, special place, and what happens is it's all being destroyed. All of this is being removed. There is nothing left. I mean, the, the outside is, is still there, but but you're you're kind of being forced into walk into all those narrow corridors, and you learn about certain things, important things. It's important to have a museum that will talk about the history of occupation of Krakow during the German time. It's, it's absolutely important. But perhaps creating it in another uh, building, which is not so historically significant, might have been a better idea. But no, it was the, the decision was made to put it into this very special museum. So walking into this, you don't really see anything left from this original authentic space that was there. Well, it's, yes, it's, it's a museum of, of, of the occupation of, of Krakow, of the German occupation of Krakow. This is very important to underline the Germans, uh, always and everywhere in, in those kind of stories. Uh, and then... The, not, not the Pomorska, no, no. Um, so, but then there is Oscar, in Oscar Schindler's factory. There is, I mean, Oscar Schindler's factory is part of, of, the, of the story. And yes, people get, we, we get those visitors saying, well, I was surprised and because I was expecting to learn about the story of the Oscar Schindler and his Jews, why I was taught about the history of occupation of Krakow. Yeah. And again, it's, it's important to talk about this, but not in that very building. Perhaps. So um, thank you for this uh, discussion and Jakob, thank you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a great privilege to be here today and be able to talk to you all. And of course, uh, I am here um, uh, also as a representative of the County Administrative Board of Skåne. And the County Administrative Board is a part of the central government uh, administration 
but it's an authority on regional level. So we have 21 counties in Sweden and 21 boards. Uh, here in Skåne, we are working like 700 people uh, in many different fields of society, uh, like uh, we're working with environmental questions, social cohesion, uh, with cultural heritage, uh, urban planning, and many other things. Um, in the field of cultural heritage, we are responsible of the core legislation in Sweden for cultural heritage protected on a national level, which is the Cultural Environmental Act. And the cultural, um, sorry, the County Administrative Board is also responsible to supervise national legislation in many other fields of society. Um, one of those fields is working with risks and risk assessments and also with coordination in times of crisis. So let's be frank. We have been living our last years in a total state of crisis. And one thing that I myself and also my organization have learned during those last years is how quickly circumstances can change and how important it is to be able to adapt to new situations. The last crisis in Sweden has been the energy crisis. And during this autumn, many parishes here in this area were facing the necessity to close down their churches for winter because of the very high costs of, of um, uh, energy. And the uh, uh, diocese of, uh, of Lund and their cultural heritage engineers were helping in a very good way the parishes to try to control uh, the effects of this uh, decrease in temperature that was normally the effect. Uh, of course, trying to manage relative humidity and indoor climate. Talking about climate, we heard Anne Grady this morning uh, talking about authorities not maybe always being such good in controlling climate change and assessment of climate change. We are in an area of Sweden where flooding is a very uh, it, um, great problem. And we have a 100 year scenario of three meters of rising sea levels which will cause uh, this area to be, be flooded to a great extent. And of course, including many important cultural heritage sites. This is an area in the very south of, of uh, Skåne, uh, where we have three churches, which would be totally flooded. Another effect of climate change is, of course, increased risk of fires. We had some important accidents in Sweden during last uh, years. And this has caused uh, an uh, increased work to try to assess um, possibilities to manage uh, uh, vulnerable and valuable objects, for example, in the church. Churches uh, and many parishes and the diocese of Lund is also working with Rescue planning, of course. Well, all, this, uh, all those risk scenarios, they have helped us to take little baby steps towards understanding uh, how to manage risks. But we are only in the beginning of this process and we have very little funding to uh, work in a more extensive way. And in one aspect in Sweden, we are not at all prepared, and that is when it comes to war. As you might know, Sweden has not been in war for more than 200 years. And that also means that we have no great experience on what it means to lose cultural heritage for, for uh, the society as a whole. Uh, on the contrary, we have seen a great deal of deliberate destruction of cultural heritage in Sweden during the last 100 years.
At the same time, we know that cultural heritage is, of course, a special target in times of war. And we see this, sadly, uh, on an everyday basis from what's happening in the Ukraine. It's evident for Swedish society that we need to prepare better. We are in a situation in Sweden where we, after 1989, um, we just, we, well, I think we, uh, we wanted to believe that the Cold War was over and there was no more imminent threat towards Sweden. And uh, a lot of the preparedness planning that we had before that in Sweden were just lost. So we are now in a situation where we have to rebuild all those, uh, uh, those aspects of preparedness. Uh, and the county administrative board is responsible for the civil defense and also have a very important role in this process, of course. Well, for the cultural heritage, we are in a situation where we need to learn to cooperate with many new uh, actors, uh, instances, and authorities in Sweden, which we are not used to prepare, to uh, cooperate with. And we have no open channels. We don't speak the same language. And there is not such a good understanding for what cultural heritage means in conflicts among, for example, all parts of the Swedish Armed Force or the Swedish Civil Contingency Agencies. Talking about ecclesiastical cultural heritage, it has a very overall protection in Sweden. All churches built before 1940 are protected by the Act. And there are also uh, special um, obligations for the Swedish church to do emergency preparedness measures. So that gives us, at the board, and the Swedish uh, church a great shared responsibility to work with those questions. Right now, we are doing some blue shield marking. I'm sure you have them in your countries, but in Sweden, we only did them in one county, in, in, uh, uh, and that was just a couple of years ago. So we are doing it now. We are mar marking the most valuable immovable objects with the blue shield mark of the Hague Convention of 1954. And we also started to work with uh, the prepared, preparedness for removal of cultural property uh, of movable, um, uh, I mean, loose objects. And that is a very complex and complicated work. And it needs to, of course, be in cooperation with many different parts of society. In the case of ecclesiastical heritage between the Swedish church and me at my board, but also with Swedish armed forces and other parts. Uh, and it raises many new and very difficult questions, uh, of course. Um, I think that was more or less what I was planning to say, but I would like to end with the fact that even if we are planning for all those very dangerous risk scenarios today, the most uh, important risk to cultural heritage will always be the risk of negligence and lack of knowledge and everything that is going on on an everyday basis everywhere. So preparing for those scenarios, we also have to deal with uh, the day-to-day -day maintenance of cultural heritage, of course, as usual. Thank you. the presentation in several steps. So first, small introduction, 
that I want to be very clear what is the difference between sustainability and resilience because so many people throw it in one pond and I think it doesn't really belong in one pond. Then about maybe some strategic solutions, what can we do and some key points. So first of all, if you, if you look at the search trends in Google about social sustainability, you can see here that it has become more and more popular but to be honest, for me, the concept was a little bit blurry. <laughs> I'm not really, I was not really sure what is this aspect, what is this pillar of social sustainability. So I tried to search for some definitions and uh, some keywords always pop up. So it's about equality, it's about uh, basic values of democracy, so it's obviously that this part of sustainability is more connected with people and not so much with things or with processes. So we have heard in the presentations that uh, this morning already that there's so much change going on in the world and it's of course very relevant to heritage and also to religious heritage. Just to give you some few key terms, we have of course climate change but we also have digitization we have globalization, we have structural change, we have de demographic change, we had this nasty pandemic and now we also have war not so far away from us. So we are living in very uh, uncertain times. And when this meets cultural heritage, usually, and we've heard it this morning and I tried to give a comment, usually cultural heritage is presented in different categories. So we have built heritage, we have tangible things, we have intangible things, we have memory of the world program. Now we have a new program called Memory Places, which is more about places of memory. But, and then we have religious heritage for this conference. So when I thought about it, I think religious heritage is a very good example that it doesn't make so much sense to sectorize cultural heritage in these different categories because everything is connected. So in my mind, cultural heritage is better to be understood as a system, and the system is made of different elements and processes, values, and in this system there is room for intangible things, tangible things, but most importantly, for people. So I think we really need to, to develop further this understanding of cultural heritage and leave this traditional categories. It doesn't make sense to make only more categories. So in very uh, high class uh, documents, like for example the divorce declaration, there has been a clear link to social sustainability and altogether cultural heritage became more prominent, not only in the divorce declaration but also, and we've heard about it in this new European Bauhaus, we have the new Leipzig Charter, in Germany we have a a federal institution dealing with uh, called Baukultur, which is at the crossroads between cultural heritage and architecture. And we have, for example, a new group that tries to make it more attractive for architects to use existing buildings, because among the architects, it's usually very popular to build something new, but it's not so popular to do renewal projects. <laughs> So when we look on it from a theoretical perspective, I think it's extremely important to understand, and we've heard the term several times this morning and yesterday, resilience. What is the difference between sustainability and resilience? And in this table, I try to give a brief overview and to put it in very basic words, sustainability comes from forest management, and the idea is basically to keep something. So it's about keeping resources. While resilience was used widely in psychology and is more connected with people. And resilience is more about personal abilities to bounce back when you have a crisis. And it's also a more systemic concept, resilience, because it doesn't have this linear narrative of sustainability. We do something and we want to keep the resources but resilience is more we are prepared for the next crisis because the next crisis is always the crisis that we don't know yet. So we have to deal with uncertainty. And I think we need both <coughs> concepts, 
but maybe today with this high level of uncertainty, resilience is even more important than sustainability. So what can we do? With a colleague, we developed this concept, and this is really for preservationists and the field of heritage, and it's about uncertainty competence. When we are living in these times where everything is changing and we don't know the next crisis, the only thing we can do on a very personal level is to learn how can we deal with uncertainty. And it's a very personal thing. It's not about a concept, it's not about a paper, it's about me. I have to learn new abilities. I have to learn things like openness or empathy. Or here we give you some ideas. First, it, of course, every change starts with the acceptance of the situation. Then we can learn specific skills like empathy, for example, or how to regulate my nervous system. Then it's about involvement. It's about real participation, not only listening, but really getting a kind of resonance with people. And then also, it's also about the, the mindset. I mean, do I have the mindset that I don't know everything and I also need to rely on other people to respond to things? Or do I have the mindset, now I know everything, I have 30 years of experience in heritage, whatever comes in my way, I will deal with it. Different approach. Then there's this technique, and it comes a lot from from the field of coaching, it's called reframing, just getting a different perspective at situations. And then, of course, we can then develop some ideas. How do we deal with all these challenges? So I put this under the term of HI, governance and cultural heritage management. I don't know every term, but behind is really this, how can we deal with uncertainty on a very personal level? And I think this is what we basically all need. So when it comes to the conclusion, just some key ideas. Current challenges, of course, have an impact on the society, but we are part of the society. If we have a systemic understanding, we are part of the system. It's not the system and us. We are part of the system. That means we start with ourselves when we want to change the system. And especially in, in times of this rapid change, a systemic perspective can help because these linear understandings, A plus B is C, doesn't work so much uh, anymore. So in a systemic understanding of heritage, there's not a strict separation between the different categories, but it's one thing that we experience also as one person, and it's not that we have different categories. And in order to deal with this change, what we really need is this uncertainty competence. And I hope I got my message ac across, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you. So thank you very much for introducing me and for giving me the opportunity to share with this audience the story of uh, an archaeological religious and historical site which is the foundation of an iconic religious center of the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the Basilica of St. Peter in the Vatican. Uh, the Basilica was built in the 16th century, right above an archaeological site known as the Necropolis of St. Peter. Where Peter, the man considered first apostle and pope, was buried almost 2,000 years ago. Now, the section and the image shows the development of the site through the centuries. Multiple layers of history, religion, art, and tradition. The necropolis uh, in the picture is the lowest uh, uh, part of the section. 10 meters under the, the church were tangible and intangible values intertwined perfectly because of many values. Religious value, because of the tomb of the first pope, Peter. Uh, archaeological value, the tombs of the ancient necropolis are there, they date back to second century AD. Historical value, as a long and complex history of religion, architecture, and significant events uh, of pope's histories are there. Architectural and artistic value. Two churches were built in the fourth and sixth century. And of course, uh, symbolic and historic and spiritual value. The popes had lived and lived in the Vatican near the tomb of the first pope, uh, where they performed the most significant rituals and religious feasts. And touristic values, simultaneous views of the area on different levels, from the archaeological area to, to, the, to the site where the popes' uh, uh, tombs are, up to the basilica. 
and the, the necropolis is managed by a traditional and ancient institution within the Vatican, which is called the Fabrica di San Pietro. This is a, a, a picture that's quite iconic because it shows uh, two of the workmen were digging in 1940s in pretty complex circumstances as the archaeological excavation was carried on during World War II. And the archaeological site of the necropolis was open to the public only 25 years uh, after its discovery. It became at the first exclusive and with a few visitors. Uh, people who take the tours of the necropolis today are made aware of the site's central value to the Christian community. All the information is provided by the office uh, to visitors who can only access with professional guided tours. And this is where access the site to a different queue from that one of the basilica, so that there is no visitor congested. Um, Lots of visitors come back to, to tour the site, which is still well known through the word of the mouth. Uh, but lots of academic papers on the site have increased over the years. Universities and cultural institutions use the site for field studies. It is a pilgrimage site with the connection to parish churches and, and cultural organizations. Now, this is a, a picture of, uh, the, of a mosaic of the archaeological area that was uh, more recently restored with a big effort of the office, uh, the Fabrica di San Pietro, and the restorers. This mosaic is the symbol of a continuous process of sustainability on the site. Sustainable tourism and religious sites should provide quality experience for tourists while protecting the environment, enhancing public awareness, without losing religious and spiritual value. The Necropolis Office uh, has uh, worked on a correct uh, information for visitors so that they can perceive the values of the site. Because one of the risks in a site as complex as this uh, Necropolis underground could be that it might become too exclusive or too touristic. The archeological area of the Necropolis represents the concurrence of religion, spirituality, history, and sustainability. Consideration for tourists, pilgrims, and scholars is essential for the site to be consistently regarded as a sustainable model of religious cultural heritage. Thank you very much for your attention. I have a question for Matthias. So Matthias, can, can you give us a case study of how you have applied your approach to see how it works in practice? You mean you, you mean the concept of heritage as a system? Yes, and what, what you presented. And, uh, Social sustainability. Well, okay. Well, I mean, it's a... Yeah, it's, it's uncertainty as well. <laughs> uncertainty as well. Oh, that's a lot. <laughs> you have time. Okay, so I give you... I, give you, I, I take make it the other way around, okay? I, I have many conferences where, for example, with ICOMOS, when I asked, okay, what is the ultimate objective of preservation? Close, please. Yeah. Of preservation. So when I ask, what is the ultimate uh, objective of preservation? What do you think I get as an answer from preservationists, usually? What is the ultimate objective of preservation? What is the usual answer? Preserve. Preserve, of course. Preserve stones. And then I say, no, it's never. The ultimate objective is always that we improve the well-being of people. Because if heritage, and I'm talking here in the spirit of the Faro Convention from the Council of Europe, if heritage has no value for people, it has no right to be heritage. Huh? But of course, I receive a lot of opposition from preservationists, but that's my mindset. I think we need to turn uh, the story around and tell a different story when it comes to heritage. Heritage is about people, and we have to start with people. And that also means that we need different people working in cultural heritage that can deal with this uncertainty and that have fantastic abilities to work with people, which often in preservation is more focused on dealing with material and fabric and stones and concepts, okay? So we had many, many projects where we tried to implement this approach. The last one was one on Jewish heritage called Rediscover. It was in the Danube region where we worked with Jewish communities and it was all, 
all was about people, you know. It was an educational project because I found that even in Germany, for example, Jewish heritage is still not very well organized and discovered and visualized. I think it's still sort of a hidden gem. So in this project, we worked with the rabbis, for example, in Timisoara and in other cities and really activated. So we start with the people and we don't start with the heritage because usually when we work with heritage, we do it like that. We have a heritage and that's extremely important. It's the only one, it's the most important, it's the highest whatever. And now we need to tell to the people why it is important. Huh? And I'm the gatekeeper, I'm the expert. I know why it is important. But people don't have a say in which heritage do they preserve? And I think this is a highly relevant question for a conference. When it is about this church that we heard this morning that is close to here, I mean, there came the question about the resources. I mean, I think it's time that the community can have a say yeah. what is heritage and what is not, because it's ultimately about resources. But at the moment, it doesn't work at all like that, you know? It's only that, like the experts define what is heritage and what is not, and the community then has to pay for it or has to deal with all the disadvantages. I mean, I don't. I know that ICOMOS is not very happy when I, when I talk like that. I'm also a member, but I think there is some time for reconsidering because the resources are not unlimited, and when it comes to climate change, of course, we need to select. You know, the archivists are used to select. 100 things goes in and they keep 10%. But in cultural heritage, in the last 50 years, Central Europe, we were on the other way around. Heritage, 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 we make everything heritage. Sharon MacDonald, if someone has read it, huh? Memory Lands, I mean, she describes it very well. I think we have to reconsider on a very basic level and we have to find a new concept of cultural heritage. And it's not stones and things and it's not documents, but it's a system. And we as a people, as, as a community, are part of the system. And it starts with the definition and the selection. And it, it cannot be a top-down process, especially with UNESCO. I'm a site manager, so I'm used to this UNESCO. I mean, it's, it's crazy how it happens, you know? Mm -hmm. We can't do it anymore. But sorry for being a little bit uh, on the revolutionary <laughs> side. <laughs> this is broadcast. <laughs> this is um, exactly what I thought when I was um, the managing director of the shoot site. So. <laughs> um, I just uh, want two things. One, the Rediscover project was phenomenal. And it was um, something that I followed all the way through. It even took part in a little bit. And, um, you know, but in, in most of the most of the towns, it was nine towns in eight countries, nine small towns in eight countries. Uh, there's not much of a Jewish community there. So a lot had to do with the partnership between the municipal authorities and the small, tiny Jewish communities, even where there wasn't a Jewish community. Um, but what I wanted to say, then you mentioned Rediscover, I just had to say how much I really liked that project uh, and admired it. And um, what I want to say is a, a colleague of ours in Warsaw says very provocatively, heritage is a verb. Mm -hmm. She uses heritage is a verb, it's not a noun. So I want to know how this resonates amongst you, and can we think of heritage as a verb? She, I don't know if you could say to heritage, but everything sort of intrinsic and everything we've been discussing is more like an active process rather than a, a simple noun. So how does that resonate? So you can think about your answers while I'm running down. Yeah, sure. Maybe I heard too many questions, but I heard several questions in that one. I mean, first of all, of course, it is a heritage. I, I, I had one article, and it's called Heritage is a System and Process verb that belongs to local communities. So it's not things. I mean, it's, it's, it's a verb, yeah, it's, it's happening, it's happening, it's a, it's a process, it's not something static. This is the big misunderstanding, because heritage is always perceived as an obstacle, as fixed, as rigid, no, it always had this processual character. And the second thing that I heard is when you said this, um, 
intrinsic heritage. I'm very allergic to intrinsic intrinsic values because this is an argument that is often used to make heritage as some aesthetic. No, but, but but you mentioned it. You mentioned it. You mentioned it. I just want to pick it up. That is, of course, a very interesting question. I think uh, uh, engaging in history and the future is one of the most fundamentally human things to do. And that includes cultural heritage. So engaging in cultural heritage processes for me is like one of the most important aspects of being a human being. And I think that that is my personal <laughs> I, I mean, base for what I do and, and my belief. So in that sense, I think, uh, Captured heritage is a verb, but I also think that uh, it includes uh, physical objects. <laughs> okay. It's very interesting, Matthias, also your point of view, because it's also mine, you have to think in the community, but, but, you know, it's experience over the years. But it is also, I think you need to add something, because it is not a button and whatever, it should be bottom up. The public should be involved more, especially also in religious heritage. But I think it's something more of togetherness because it needs the experts. Uh, they can give guidance, but they have to stand, they have to facilitate the public in order to start using these places or reusing them or finding new values for these. Because if you have heritage and it has no value for the society of nowadays, for the people of nowadays or for the future people, why should we keep it? And I know I love this type of heritage, but I think that's a real genuine question. But I think also the word togetherness is very important because none of these different, um, not the organizations, not the institutions, not the authorities, it is, it is a, a great um, challenge we are facing. So we are in this game together. And that's, I just wanted to add if you agree with that because I think that's very important. Otherwise, if you give it like in the final convention, if you would say it is only the public, it will also go wrong. It is a combination of things. Maybe just a very quick answer. You, you're absolutely right. It's about, and I, I love this term, and we heard it a few times, it's about resonance. We need to create this resonance between the different levels. But trying to do this for, I don't know, <laughs> feels like 100 years, maybe it was only 30, I don't know, but it's extremely hard to do that because the different levels have different languages and have the different uh, arenas, you know, and uh, it's, it's really hard. It's, and there are not many with this mindset who think that it is necessary. So I absolutely agree that this is the way to go, but the question is, how can we do it? Yeah. Yeah. Very good. I'm here. <laughs> Any more comments or questions? I think it was an overwhelming um, panel afternoon. Yes. Applaud them again, please. <laughs>
Uh, so it's about cultural sustainability as well. So we've got a wide range of applications. Yes, do you? A wide range of uh, applications, um, of course. We had, we had to select because that was our task. Um, we as a commission, um, which will be announced later, we um, uh, selected finalists, five finalists who exemplify the different facets, the different aspects of sustainability and demonstrate that I find also very interesting remembering. It was also uh, already a couple of months ago. It yeah, yeah. June, it was around the summer of last year. Um, sustainability and to demonstrate that innovation does not always have to be digital. And we will <laughs> visualize that later on. We certainly will. So the, uh, the expert panel of jurists was made up of this fantastic chap here, Julian Curson, who's a professor of cultural history at the University of Bergen and a member of the FRH Council as well, I believe. So he was holding the fort for FRH here, uh, along with Florian Trott, who's the managing director and member of the board of directors of Starich Kusthaler Karlsruhe in Germany, which I said very fast in the attempt to sound slightly German. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I pulled that one off. And then the third member of the jury was, in fact, uh, me. Uh, I'm the master and uh, chief executive of the Charter House in London. So, let's move on to uh, a bit of a description about the projects that we had to uh, look at and decide. These were the ones we decided were the finalists. So, Justin, you go first. Thank you, Peter. Um, so, we're going to walk through the list of five uh, finalists. Um, of the majority of these finalists, we have representatives here in the room. Um, the first two, uh, unfortunately, could not make it here, so I will just uh, briefly uh, present uh, those two, or I'll start with the first one, which is... This project, uh, entitled Peregrino de Raniero Digital 4.0. Uh, this um, project was uh, developed by Zwit, project Territorio Rural Inteligente in Spain, of course, as you can hear. The digital project Peregrino Llevaniego Digital 4.0 was born to revitalize the rural areas crossed by the Llevaniego Way in the northern region of Cantabria on the north, on the north coast of Spain. Thanks to an app and 15 beacons powered by solar panels, Pilgrims and visitors have access to free Wi-Fi throughout the whole route, and it's re really rural there, so that's already a great effort. It has become the first interconnected pilgrimage route in the world. That is another aspect that can be underscored. That was the first finalist. So the second finalist was the Jewish Virtual Tourism Project by Jewish Mallorca. And uh, this was a project born in the wake, as we perhaps all remember, in the pandemic that we faced. And we weren't allowed to travel anywhere. And then no one could go and see uh, areas of cultural heritage. So these guys offered tours through Zoom. And Jewish Mallorca managed to bridge the distance barrier by taking visitors on a virtual tour of the island's Jewish heritage in real time. So they had people walking around with you, with you on a Zoom call, which is a which was which was a brilliant brilliant idea. I'm, I'm sorry they're not here today either. But, uh, then is it me again? Yes, it's you again. Ah, ah, this one, right? So there are people here representing this one here today, which is the next one. Yes, I'll do. Yeah, uh, sorry, it's not that one. <laughs> <laughs> is this one? So the Ambulance for Monuments, um, which is by the Associated Mon Monumentum in Romania. Uh, so the Ambulance for Monuments aims to save endangered monuments with a unique and ex effective modus operandi. And I, what I didn't notice was, do you actually have a big flashing light on top of the van that takes you to this place? So a van is equipped with the tools so if you've, got a, if you've got a heritage emergency and no one else can help you, who are you going to call? It's <laughs> not Ghostbusters, it's going to be Ambulance for Monuments. Uh, and these guys come on site with a group of experts and craftsmen and assess the damage, stabilise the patient, 
And then finally, a team of volunteers returns the patient to a healthy state. A brilliant idea. And I think the guys are here uh, from Ambulance yep. for Monuments. Yeah, <laughs>
big drum roll, please, because we're going to move on to the winner. I am very proud to announce that the winner of the 2022 Religious Heritage Innovation Award is Orgel Kids by Kirk Music Network. Uh, so this is an amazing innovation. You might have noticed uh, something sitting over there. The Church Music Network was selected by the jury as the Religious Heritage Innovator of the Year for the project Orgel Kids. Uh, we all loved this project. It was, it was genuinely innovative. Uh, we were very happy. It brought a smile to all of our faces. Uh, and the joy, I can only imagine it brings. It brought me a little bit of joy just having a little tinker uh, a minute ago as well. So this brings children into contact with organ pipes in a really appealing way, which I hope they're going to demonstrate in a second, uh, with an organ consisting of 128 wooden parts, which children have to assemble by themselves. What's built over there? Uh, this organ is able to produce music. The unique methodology of organ kids was born in 2009 in the Netherlands, but has become a global movement and is present more than 20 countries. And I believe the update is 160 of these are all around the world, 25 countries now. Uh, so I think uh, you should all get one because they're really good fun. <laughs> Uh, and let's present the prize because it's a brilliant project and we were really pleased to award this to you. So, big round of applause. And... Almost everyone, every person in the world 
should meet a pipe organ <coughs> once in your life. Doesn't matter at what age, but let's start with the children. This was my situation, 1964, and this was in uh, 20, 2018. You see almost the same uh, interest in what is it, what is happening uh, when you press a key. And this is uh, the, the main goal. Organs are cultural heritage, everyone knows. But why should we restore all these old organs if there are no organs left to play them? The situation in the Netherlands. We have a fantastic organ heritage, and most of them are in a, a, a wonderful condition. Um, but um, there are some <coughs> other problems, the closing of churches, and due to the secularization, fewer people go to church, so children do not meet a uh, church organ in the normal church service. So you have to take them there and give them more interest. Uh, we have a rather poor uh, musical education in primary schools at the moment, and uh, children all, only choose an instrument that they know. And if you know a piano and you don't know an organ, then you want to play the piano. So we have to uh, attract, make it attractive for them. Now, how it started? In 2009, it started as a part of my last will. Uh, I wanted to create a special fund. In the Netherlands, we have the Culture Funds, and you can have a, a, a fund on your own name. But I started with a website to give people some ideas. What can you do to make children meet the church organ? And then everyone said, why should you wait until you are dead and can just see it from your cloud? Just start now. Right. So I did. And uh, as a very lucky meeting, I teamed up with Wim Janssen. You saw him on the picture. Or at least a retired organ builder. And just at the moment that I was searching for such an organ that you can take in a normal car to school, he had a prototype of what we now call the do organ. And a do organ is of the verb doing something uh, as an opposite of demonstration organ. And you have to watch at it. Hands on your back, please, and don't touch. This one should be touched. Here is Wim Janssen again. Uh, yeah, and how is it going? Now we have over 160. Uh, you can rent it from me uh, in the Netherlands. You can buy the plans to build your own one. And you can order for a complete set like this. Uh, and that are those 160. But there are also some 180 people who ordered for the plans. But I don't know if they finished their orphans. And there are five organ builders in, uh, in the world that uh, build them in license now. Well, this is the mission. Uh, take the organ to the youth and take the youth to the organ. And our basic program is uh, old school, something about different types of families of uh, instruments. The second lesson is build a do organ and play it. And the uh, third lesson is a field trip to uh, a church or a concert hall to visit it and see it in the bigger uh, edition. And mostly close with a, a special concert for children. Uh, you, the fun is that you can take it outside. You are not just inside. It can be used on cultural markets or uh, festivals or whatever. Um, now, and Orphan Kids shares lots of other things to inspire organists and music teachers to do more with the organ. I keep this short, but, but there is much more to find on our website. And uh, this is the success formula. The do organ has 128 parts, as already mentioned, in a box. And you can build it in 45 minutes with a group of 15, 16 children. Then you divide the tasks. That's the, the yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I can show you a little video. It's a, a two minutes something.
do. I think I work with him very much together. Um, some slides. Well, the, the keyword simple. The fun was the first one. Simple is the second. Just in a normal car. And we have these uh, very new uh, flight cases yes. to make it even more better <laughs> <laughs> for transportation. These ones, yeah. and then you see that everything is complete afterwards. And as, uh, my last uh, word is dissemination. We uh, started with one organ, and now uh, many people saw it on the internet and Facebook and Twitter and our website. So from all over the world, the questions came. We want this here, <coughs> and we started first in Belgium, and now we have these countries in Europe. There is on our website, there is a map, you can just see where they are. So if there is something in your neighborhood, please check and visit them. Uh, USA, Canada, and Suriname. This is Hawaii, it's not just in the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the fun for me is that it has become an international network. So we are working together with all those local and uh, 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 regional uh, project managers and we share our ideas and materials and that's the very interesting thing of it that in every country there are different ways to do it and we share it together uh, as an example Orgel Kids Taiwan it's, it's called Orgel Kids in a lot of countries um, uh, they have an organ camp, organ camp every year and the uh, first year it was, they had 100 tickets, it was sold out within 16 hours. 100 kids from all over Taiwan come to a place in a concert hall and have a wonderful week all around organs, music. Uh, and another one uh, recently is uh, Kids, because it's Slovenian, <laughs> Slovenia. And there is a retired organ builder who builds those kids with teenagers. So he uh, uh, teaches them these uh, skills, eh, as the year of skills, 2023, yeah. uh, the, the, to build these organs in his workshop. Um, it it mm -hmm. gives you the opportunity to connect to all kinds of international things, like World Make Music Day in uh, June, or Bach in the Subways, which is also an international project to play Bach on places that you don't expect. <laughs> and also there are maker fairs for hobbyists to create things. Yeah. Uh, it can be used in that uh, festivals too. And um, there is a traveling exhibition in the USA uh, around the book, things come apart. You can build this organ, but you can also start with the built up organ and take it apart, mm -hmm. the other way around. So, we collect the ideas, it's just a book now in the Netherlands, but we are aiming to make this, this a website with a lot of searching engines, so you can search for a special activity for let's say 30 minutes for children about 10 year old and it has to do with technology or with music and then what is available at, at activities to do it. Coming soon. Um, in the end, the lessons learned, it's not about having an organ. Maybe you think so, but it's having a plan for successful organ promotion. That must be the success. So, Talk about the organization, you need material development around it, it's not just this kit. And you have to train the trainers, that's where all the uh, international managers mostly come to me and I give them a trainer, trainer sessions. And it's on building relationships with schools, with uh, museums, with, with uh, 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 libraries, churches of course but you need to work together to make this a success. Now, how to get one? You can rent it, you can build one, or you can buy one. And as I said, we are extremely happy <laughs> to win this prize. Thank you so much. Well,
loved the fact that there was a kid with a Ramones t-shirt on building the pipe organ. And the second thing is, I didn't say that the jury were, were, were all really pleased to be able to give an award to something that wasn't digital and living uh, online. It was something very real and very practical, and you've been amazing. So, well done. Okay. Thank you very much.